I'm delighted that you're here and I always love talking to whatever size the audience is and um, it makes for a nice kind of interactive place um, when we just have a few people so I'm hoping you'll give lots of comments and suggestions today. Um, as you can see by the information on the table, um, my talks are supported by the Oregon Geriatric Education Center, which is funded by the Health Services Research Administration to do outreach and um, providing education in geriatric topics ac across the state of Oregon. And so um, we do a number of talks like this, and Megan Morgove is our program manager. She's out here as well today, and um, the reason I've got a uh, microphone on, even though you don't hear any microphone, is because we're going to videotape this and we often put our talks up on our website so that people can have access to them afterwards. Um, you know, if you have questions, you can kind of go back and review or, or just call me or whatever, but um, this will be available on our website after the talk today. Um, so uh, this is a complicated question. Um, so many of our older patients do have some cognitive impairment. And it's um, something that we're, you know, in primary care, we're so busy doing so many other things. And I think every time I see a patient in the clinic, they have at least 17 problems on their list for the day. And kind of getting around to whether or not they have trouble with their memory is oftentimes really complex. And there's so many things going on that it makes it tough. So my hope for today is that we can very quickly um, think about how to confidently diagnose um, cognitive impairment in patients and then really think through what type of cognitive impairment it is and be able to pin down one of the most common types of dementia um, in our patients. And this is really important because treatment strategies differ, prognosis differs, everything is a little bit different depending on which type of dementia a patient has. And I really feel that it is possible within primary care to narrow down or at least come to a pretty good guess of which type of dementia your patient has so that you can do kind of the best job of taking care of that individual patient. Then we're going to turn and talk a little bit about um, driving cessation because I think this is another one of the really complex questions that we deal with in our older patients um, who have some cognitive impairment. Um, and then talk a little bit about kind of the risks of some of the medications we use in older adults and how that might um, interface with uh, cognitive impairment in people. So let's start with the patient. Um, Mrs. Atkinson is 82. Um, her husband died about six months ago. And um, today her daughter reports some increasing forgetfulness. Um, she thinks it's been going on since before Mrs. Atkinson's um, husband died, but it's gotten worse since the time of his death. The daughter notices that her mom quickly forgets conversations and has trouble paying the bills um, since the death of her husband. More recently, she's also been neglecting her parents, unable to keep up with the housework. Um, luckily, she doesn't take too many uh, medications, just hydrochlorothiazide, baby aspirin, a daily multivitamin, and she's been using a little bit of diphenhydramine for insomnia. Um, all right, so a little bit more on Mrs. Atkinson. She doesn't have any trouble with her ADLs, um, more than a uh, welcome, <laughs> um, more than an occasional lack of grooming. She's not having any trouble with walking or mobility. She was initially very sad over the death of her husband, but has kind of come to terms with her grief. Um, she hasn't had any trouble with wandering or agitation, loss of appetite. She's never smoked or drank. She studied the Romance languages in college, and she still practices Italian once a week with a friend. So anyone want to make a guess as to what type of cognitive impairment Mrs. Atkinson might have? Yeah, um, Colleen? Is there a complication with taking the diaphragm? <laughs> That's a wonderful question. Thank you for asking that. Yes, uh, we're, we're going to talk about that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good. You're, you're, you are right to say I'm not even going to venture a guess right now because she's got a complicating factor that I'm going to try to get rid of first. Good. I, I, like, I like that approach. All right. So here's what just came out this morning that you're getting the very first hand knowledge of. Um, and this was published today in the Annals of Internal Medicine. Um, I was one of the authors on the paper. But um, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, um, which is the organization that puts out screening recommendations um, for everybody in the U.S., you know, they put out guidelines for dental screenings in kids and whether or not you should take aspirin to prevent heart disease um, in adulthood, um, all sorts of things, colorectal cancer screening guidelines, those kinds of things. Well, they asked us to do a systematic review 
of screening for cognitive impairment. Um, and the results were published today, and then the U.S. Preventive Task Force um, new recommendations on screening for cognitive impairment were published online this morning in draft form. So we're going to talk about them a little bit today. And um, so what is the rationale for screening for cognitive impairment? Well, even in today's age when we're really becoming more conscious of the um, risk of cognitive impairment in our older adults, somewhere between about 25 and 75 percent of patients are not recognized by their primary care clinicians when they have cognitive impairment. So it's kind of going under the radar screen in, in most of our primary care practices. And we know that early identification may have benefits um, in optimizing clinical care, you know, finding those reversible causes like medications that really shouldn't be given, um, managing comorbidities like congestive heart failure, which can cause acute um, decline in cogn cognition, facilitating decision making. All of these things are so important in managing our patients who have some cognitive impairment. However, we don't have very good treatments for cognitive impairment yet, do we? And over the last 15, 20 years, a number of drugs have come out where, and people have said, oh, I hope this is finally going to give us some real benefit in treating dementia. And when the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force puts out guidelines, one of their key features is that you can catch the disease early and then you can provide treatment that improves longevity or cures the disease, right? So colorectal cancer is a great example. You do a colonoscopy, you see a polyp, you take the polyp out, and the person never gets colon cancer, right? Well, what's that story with dementia? It's not as good, is it? First of all, what is preclinical dementia? You know, if you're not recognizing or somebody isn't noticing many memory problems and it's not impacting your day-to-day -day life, do you have dementia? Well, probably not, right? So it, it doesn't have that same kind of definition of preclinical disease. You can certainly try to catch the disease early, right? And that's probably where our goal should be, hey. Um, but uh, preclinical disease, hey there, how's it going? <laughs> um, preclinical disease is, is a little stickier subject and we're not even sure it exists in, um, in dementia. Um, also, the drugs that we've got so far, as I already mentioned, provide some benefit, but not really enough benefit to be meaningful at a population level. So what do I mean by that? We've got a number of classes of drugs that we can use for cognitive impairment. Um, there's the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors like uh, Dinepazil or Aricept, and then there's um, Mamantine or Nemenda, and all of those drugs can do some good in the short term. However, the amount of good they do is minimal. And probably what that boils down to is that there are a bunch of people who don't receive any benefit from the drug and a few people who receive noticeable benefit from the drug. So how many of you have prescribed acetyl like Dinepazil or Mamantine or any of those drugs? Beth has, a couple people have. So when we prescribe those drugs, we're, we're hoping for a noticeable benefit, right? And the only way for us to see whether they're getting benefit is to do objective testing at the beginning, you know, seeing, you know, what is your function? Can you do your activities of daily living? Can you do your independent activities of daily living? What are your scores on your tests? And then do those stabilize out or improve after I've used the drug? And I try to be very consistent about putting somebody on the drug for six months and then retesting and seeing if the scores are better, asking if their function is better, things like that. So I can say, yes, you are a responder, okay? And probably only 20 to 40% of the people we see in a primary care um, clinic are going to be responders to these drugs, okay? So that's kind of the long answer to this first part. There's a small amount of benefit in the short run, but it's probably because a few people are responders and a larger group of people are non-responders. So what our job becomes is really being careful with our assessments to ensure that we're able to detect the people who are responders. 
Also, discontinuation of these drugs is very high, and um, harms of the medication can include um, problems with um, the nervous system, cardiovascular system, and most commonly, nausea and diarrhea. And I'm sure all of you have seen patients who had side effects on these medications. There was one study in the VA, Bob, you'll find this interesting, um, that showed that people who got started on denepazil and other acetylcholinesterase inhibitors had a higher incidence of pacemaker maker placement. Um, I thought that was a little discouraging because rather than just having that denepazil stopped, they actually got a pacemaker added, which I'm not sure was the best approach. All right, so, um, so the drugs can be helpful in the short run and not for all people. Um, the, so the review also showed that um, complex interventions <coughs> aimed at caregivers. So kind of where um, interventions such as where a nurse goes out to the home and talks with a caregiver and helps them learn how to cope with their um, loved one who has cognitive impairment, these are also effective interventions. Um, but again, they don't show a huge benefit and they're pretty expensive to conduct. So um, the overall strength of the evidence is fairly small. And then lastly, cognitive stimulation or sending somebody to um, a therapist to do some cognitive retraining and cognitive stimulation does show evidence of benefit. Again, it's not huge benefit, but a little bit. And for those who um, arrived a little bit late, what I'm describing is the new evidence review that was just published today um, that I was part of on screening for cognitive impairment. So we're kind of talking through the things that were found to have evidence to support their use. So, you know, drugs in the short term, and then some of the more complex psychosocial interventions, as well as cognitive stimulation, all have evidence to support their use um, for dementia. However, and like I said, this came out at about 6 o'clock our time this morning, um, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force decided not to change their 2000 rec 2003 recommendation of having an eye or insufficient evidence to support f um, for or against screening for cognitive impairment simply because as we described it's really hard to it's really hard to pin down what preclinical cognitive impairment is you know there's we just don't have a good framework for what is preclinical cognitive impairment if you're if there's not some recognizable memory trouble or something it's you know you gen you don't have dementia it's like kind of like we're all zeros on the fast score at least i hope i'm still a zero you know all the stages of dementia stage 7 is end stage dementia where you're about ready to die but stage 0 is no disease so i'm like okay well i guess we're all uh, we're already on the scoring system um, anyway, so uh, the task force has left it an eye, insufficient evidence for or against screening for dementia. Um, the screening tools are good enough, and we're going to talk about those in just a moment. Um, drugs, cognitive therapy, and caregiver interventions provide some benefit, but at a population level, um, they've determined that that benefit is insufficient. Um, the clinical relevance remains uncertain. and. There's not enough studies on how earlier diagnosis of dementia affects decision making um, for overall care. And that's one of the most important questions we tried to ask in this study was, does finding dementia earlier, does making a diagnosis a little bit earlier improve medical decision making, ability of that patient to participate in their care, do things like advanced directive planning and those kinds of things? And so the summary statement, while the overall evidence on routine screening is insufficient, clinicians should remain alert to early signs and symptoms of cognitive impairment and evaluate those as appropriate. And I, I think this is a nice bottom line for us. It's probably not going to help us to do widespread screening of people for memory disturbance, but it probably is good for us to have a very high awareness when we see patients. And if we detect, you know, gaps in the history, inconsistent story from one visit to another, or if the patient says, you know, my memory's not as good as it used to be, or if what happens a lot in my practice, the daughter comes in with mom and says, I don't know, mom's memory isn't as good as it used to be, that's when I would really start thinking about this. Now, as I said, the, these uh, guidelines were just released this morning. Um, there's the website, and uh, 
they are open for comment. So if anybody's kind of interested in this topic and wants to review it, um, and even you know, provide a comment or your own perspective from your primary care vantage point, um, comments are welcome. We, would, we will appreciate any sort of comments. You know, what, if, what are you guys seeing in your practice around, around kind of thinking about, thinking about how to detect dementia or cognitive impairment? Seems like the media and the science are way far advanced in early detection and uh, explaining that to people who are coming in to be really detected mm -hmm. is a challenge. And so just yep. it's helpful to have you come and clarify what's clinically appropriate now. And yeah. that's going to keep changing. So. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's so, then, I mean, not only is the evidence, you know, maybe not perfect yet, you know, we always hate the word insufficient. I have to say, we worked on this project for two years, and our top goal was to get the task force to get off of the I, you know, get off of that I statement. Don't leave it insufficient. We want more than that. But, but we couldn't. You know, the evidence wasn't strong enough. They, they couldn't take what we were able to provide and move it off of an I. But at the same time, it was very clear that they could say, you know what, while screening is not the right way to go, case finding is. And we really need to be thinking about this in a case-finding way. If, there's, if you have any red flags, if the patient, you know, if they were regular for appointments and now they're starting to arrive late, um, you know, any red flags should trigger um, a screening. Just to make things more complicated, the DSM-5 has, gone, it has totally changed all of the nomenclature on this as well. So it's not even called dementia anymore. <laughs> um, and this came out in May, so it's also pretty fresh and new. Um, and they're now calling it major neurocognitive disorder instead of calling it dementia. Um, the reason they made this change was because they decided that the term dementia had a lot of negative connotations to it and that public perception around the term dementia was so scary that they wanted to try, try to get away from that scariness. I'm not sure this does it. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure I want to have neuro, major neurocognitive disorder. I might rather have dementia. Um, but, uh, and I don't know how readily this will actually get into clinical practice. I'm guessing we will probably still call it dementia for a very long time. But I just wanted you to know that this is what the DSM-5 is showing. Um, it's very similar to the old criteria, except I think they've added something really important. This is a brand new category, this notion of social cognition. So your ability to kind of fit in at a party and talk to people and chat and you know, meet new people and have an appropriate conversation, the, the notion of behavioral regulation of you know, not kind of flying off the handle at every little thing, which can often happen very early on in patients who have um, the start of dementia. And so that is, that, that social cognition piece is now a part of the diagnosis for dementia. And sometimes people still have a pretty darn good memory, don't they? But they're starting to have trouble with their finances. They're starting to have trouble kind of understanding abstract concepts. You know, I have, I have wives who come in and say, you know, he used to be able to understand my side of the story, and now it's his way or the highway. You know, they kind of lose that ability to distinguish um, the gray zone. And that's kind of what they've added in here is this, this emotional intelligence side of things. So I, I do like that piece of things. Um, and then um, instead of mild cognitive impairment, it's uh, also called um, minor neurocognitive disorder um, is the new um, term for, the, for what, what we've always called mild cognitive impairment. And again, it has to be a decline from prior level of function. Uh, but with um, mild cognitive impairment, the, basically, you might have some memory problems, you might have some decrease in test scores, but it can't yet interfere with independent activities of daily living, like driving, shopping, those kinds of things. It can't be bad enough to truly interfere with those tasks of daily life. Um, interestingly, about the average um, time of progression from MCI to dementia is about seven years. So that's a while. And going back to this question of case finding, if we were able to case find and catch people when they're at the MCI stage, you know, when they're in the mild cognitive impairment stage, we would have as much as seven years to help them determine a plan for retiring from driving, to help them determine a plan for their advanced directives, a plan 
for you know what might happen when my wife can't take care of me anymore on her own. You know, we'd have all this time to do this decision making and make sure that we were meeting the patient's goals for what's going to happen in the future. Um, the other thing that's interesting about some of the newer data on this is that we always thought MCI consistently progressed to dementia at some point, right? We think it's basically kind of a pre-dementia stage. Most people with MCI are going to go on to dementia. Some of the newer studies show that actually about 10 to 30 percent of people that have a diagnosis of MCI revert back to normal. So it's not an absolute certainty that you're going to progress to dementia if you've got mild cognitive impairment. I think that's very interesting. And I don't know if it's the people who decide to exercise and do diet and all the kind of stuff we're going to talk about in a minute, but I do find it fascinating that a number of people do basically revert back to normal. All right, so if you're worried that somebody has cognitive impairment, what tests do you typically do on them? A mini mental status, okay. Um, and that's what we were all trained to use, wasn't it? So, and the MMSC test was looked at in our evidence review that we just finished, and it was shown to be good at making a diagnosis of dementia. Now, interestingly, it's good at ruling it in. So if your scores are low, it's good at ruling in dementia, but it has less sensitivity. It's less good at ruling it out. So the, the mini mental status test misses some dementia in people who st are still in the mild stages. And it's actually quite a poor test for mild cognitive impairment. You, you probably need to have true dementia before your MMSE is going to be too low. So when I'm thinking about my patients, and um, you know my practice is really busy, and I've, if there's a little bit of a red flag, I start with something quicker than the mini mental status exam or any of the others. I start with just the plain old mini cog, the three item recall plus the clock. And I say to people, okay, I'm gonna have you remember three words. I use three different words every time because that way I have to remember it too. It's like my own dementia prevention. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then you have them do the clock. And after they've done the clock, you have them come back and remember those three words um, to see if they got it right. And um, I always have them set, I always give the full instructions before I give them the paper because I don't, I want them to listen to my instructions before they start drawing the clock. And I always say, and once you start drawing, I can't remind you of what time I asked you to set the hands to. So that's the memory component. They have to remember what time they set it to. So here's some clocks. And uh, this is a fabulous test. The clock draw test is an, is an awesome test. All right. So... If somebody draws a clock like this, what do you do? If somebody, one of these, yeah? <laughs> Lose hope, right? <laughs> I mean, so if, if, if I am seeing somebody and I don't know they already have dementia, and they, they start off their clock and it looks like that, I abandon my testing. I say, OK. We're not going to have time for this today. We probably have to set up a special appointment because that person's got pretty bad dementia, don't they? To have a clock that bad, they've got to have multiple defects going on. And you are not going to have time in today's 15-minute visit to get very far into their evaluation. But, and, and, you know, it's definitely saying something when the clock is, is that bad. And, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit kidding. You can try to go on and, um, you know, do another test, but probably you're going to need to do a more intensive dementia evaluation when somebody starts their clock like that. If somebody draws this clock, which area of their brain is impaired? A clock like this. So in this, this guy didn't plan very well, did he? He didn't, he, he, he got part way around and he, he realized, uh-oh, I'm going to have to do 1110. I better make sure that I get my 11 on there. And so this is executive function. This is the side of the brain, the planning side of the brain. Um, certainly one of the most important areas for maintaining independence, your executive function. So, um, and this guy... He, got to, he didn't plan very well, and for, for God, he needed an 11, so he just stopped at 8. 
this guy didn't plan very well, and, but he remembered he was going to need that 11, and he, he just kind of put it up there. So these are all planning issues. And the clock draw test is a fantastic t test to assess somebody's driving ability. Because driving is all about planning, right? And if you can't do a clock draw test and plan well enough to get a clock draw test right, you're probably not good enough to drive anymore. So it's a, it's a great test when you're thinking about, uh, about driving in your patients. Um, what's wrong here? Numbers are backwards. <laughs> so that brain area is visual spatial, right? And we kind of forget to think about visual spatial sometimes when we're assessing for dementia. You know, we're thinking about memory, we're thinking about all these other things. We forget about visual spatial. Should this guy be driving? No, he's gonna look right and turn left, right? And I'm kind of amazed how often I see, <laughs> how often I see people do this clock. And you know, sometimes there, there'll be a daughter in the room and I'll turn to the daughter and I'll say, how's your dad's driving? And she'll say, well, I don't know, he seems to pull out in traffic all the time. <laughs> I'm like, well, it's because he's looking the wrong way. So you know, it is, this, this creeps up pretty often. If somebody draws this clock, please fill out the mandatory impairment form for the DMV today. Do not wait. This is an accident waiting to happen. Um, so, um, so that's visual impairment. Now, what's, what about this clock? What's wrong with that person's brain? You asked him to set it to 10 past 11. So, the arms are in the wrong spot, right. So this person has lost the ability to abstract. You have to be able to abstract to put that hand on the two. See how easy this test is to find so many brain abnormalities? I mean, it's just wonderful. So this person can no longer abstract. And he's, you, you said 11, 10, and they set the two hands on the 11 and the 10, OK? <laughs> What if this guy went digital on you, right? That's, a <laughs> that's, that's another loss of abstractability, OK? This guy became concrete and said, OK, well, I'm just going to do an 11.10 there for you, Doc. Um, so anyway, the, so the clock draw test is a great test. It really can point out a lot of problems. Um, and then when done with the three-item recall, that gives you a nice memory piece as well. OK, well, let's move on. Anybody ever done a slums? St. Louis Mental Status Exam, St. Louis University. Um, so this is a test that I recommend. If you have red flags about a patient and you think you need to do a good screening test for MCI or dementia, or you've done a mini cog and they've flunked it, this is a quick and easy test that has been validated for both dementia and MCI, OK? It's available for free, slums.org. Um, I hate the name, that's kind of a little disappointing, but... Um, St. Louis. Yeah, St. Louis University, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it's kind of a depressing place, isn't it? Um, <laughs> it's free, um, and it's fairly quick to perform, um, and, it's, and it's pretty fun. Patients like it. They like the story. Jill was a very successful stockbroker. She made a lot of money on the stock market. You know, it's just, it's kind of fun. Patients, patients enjoy the slums. And, and people ask me, oh, there's a slums on the clock, on the, or there's a clock on the slums and there's a clock on the minicog. Do I have to do the clock over again? I say, no. If you did a minicog first and they couldn't do a clock there, they're not going to be able to do it for you when you do it on the slums. So you don't have to repeat your clock if you've had one recently. Um, but I really like this test, and I, I would encourage using this in patients who have red flags. All right, how about the, fun yeah. For the clinician as well. It is more fun for the, the clinician. Mini the mini, it's boring. <laughs> it's terribly boring. <laughs> yes, thank you. I, I totally agree with you. Okay, anyone ever used a mocha? So this is the one my father makes him, me give him every year. And uh, on many years, he gets a higher score on it than I do, so, uh, but, uh, so this, this is another test that has about the same level of evidence as the slums. They've been studied in some trials, not as widespread as the testing on the MMSE, but some evidence to support that it's a really good test. And um, this test is particularly good for driving because it, here's the clock draw. You'd have to put, do your clock here. But this also has a trails B test on it. 
So trails B, you have to go 1A, 2B, 3C. You know, you have to do that. And that's another of the best executive function tests, okay? Planning test to be able to do a trails B. So between the clock and the trails B, this is a fantastic test to give people if you're worried about their driving ability, okay? It's also a particularly good test if, the, if you're worried about vascular dementia. And it's particularly good if your patient has Parkinson's disease. So this is another one I encourage you to use. It's also free, mocha.org, mochatest.org, sorry. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's another, especially, you know, if you're starting to get tired of doing the slums, um, try this one instead. It's, an, it's another excellent test. I think it takes a couple minutes longer. So I, I tend to, in an undifferentiated population, I tend to use the slums a little more frequently just because I think it's a little bit faster than this one. The MMSE, well, what is it good for? So this is actually the test you want to use once somebody's diagnosed with dementia and you are now following them over time, okay? To follow the progression of their disease or if you decide you're gonna try a medication. Now, it costs how much? Do you guys have a system to pay for the MMSE if you use it? You're, we're, we're all supposed to be paying about $1.38 to every time we use an MMSE. I, I, don't, I don't actually know whether my clinic is doing that because I do MMSEs once in a while, although I don't do them very often now. I usually use the other test. But if somebody has dementia, um, this is the only test that's been d validated for following dementia over time. Yes? Does that mean the other ones haven't been studied? That is that absolutely correct. The other ones have not been studied for following dementia over time. They've only been studied to diagnose MCI and to diagnose dementia. Okay, so once somebody meets criteria for dementia by functional status and, and slums testing, then I'll do an MMSE on them and I'll follow the MMSE over time, okay? And the MMSE, on average, score will decline two to four points per year in somebody who has dementia, okay? So if you've got somebody who's just on a regular steady course of dementia, their MMSE, MMSE score is, de, is um, expected to decline by two to four points per year, okay? If you do an MMSE on somebody and their score goes down by like eight points in one year or eight points in six months, that lets you know that something else is going on, right? I mean, that should not happen because of their dementia alone. So maybe they've got new undetected hypothyroidism or an overlying delirium or something else that's making their MMSE score decline so much more quickly. So it's kind of nice to be able to follow that trajectory. The other thing this can help you with is if you do decide to use medications for dementia, and we talked a little bit about the, at the beginning that you know, if you're going to try Dinepazil or some of the medications for dementia, you're gonna to wanna to do it in a way that you do objective testing before and after. And if you give somebody Dinepazil and at the end of a year, their MMSE score is stable or maybe only declined by one point, that drug is probably helping that patient, okay? Because they should have had two to four points of decline and now they've only had zero or one point. So that's probably a beneficial drug for that patient, okay? These drugs are not miracle cures. They do not make scores go up for the most part. I've had a few people whose scores went up and I love that. But most of the time it doesn't happen, yeah. Absolutely, yes. If they decline by four points in a year after using the drug, then I say this, you, you have not had any effect. Now, every once in a while, because I do see this pretty regularly, every once in a while, the daughter comes in and says, oh, mom's so much better. She only asked the question three times instead of 50 times, and she can get dressed now, and she doesn't need help with her um, cooking. And, and you know, they'll say there's so much ADL improvement that I'll say, well, okay, even though her scores have declined, I'm willing to give you the benefit of the doubt and continue this drug because you've really noticed the functional improvement. All right, so let's talk about a, a little bit about the types of dementia because, you know, that's the other thing that's kind of important to be able to sort out. And Alzheimer's is still the most common, um, and that is impairment in memory. So you have to have memory trouble to have Alzheimer's, of course. And then just one of these other areas and see how I've added that additional category of social cognition can be one of the areas of impairment um, in people who have um, Alzheimer's dementia. And a lot of people say to me, Elizabeth, 
what's the most common second finding in, dement in Alzheimer's? You know, memory loss has to be there. Is it executive function? Is it, is it verbal fluency? What's the next most common? And that answer is there isn't a next most common. People can present with memory impairment and any of the other core, um, core uh, findings in, in Alzheimer's dementia. So all of these are common in people who have Alzheimer's. Vascular dementia is the one we love to misdiagnose. Um, having brain imaging evidence of small vessel disease or white matter infarcts does not mean you have vascular dementia. Um, it, you have to have evidence of a prior CVA um, on imaging or physical findings or history that are consistent with prior CVA or TIA to be called vascular dementia, okay? A lot of our radiologists put these kind of small vessel vascular infarcts and then we think, oh, they've got vascular dementia and that's actually, that's probably not true. Um, so they might have Alzheimer's disease with small vessel infarcts. If they have small vessel infarcts, it often worsens the course of disease. So these things do seem to matter but they do not mean that the patient has vascular dementia. Lewy body, how many people have seen Lewy body dementia? I don't know, maybe, yeah, <laughs> possibly. Okay, so um, everybody says, how do I tell Lewy body from Alzheimer's? Well, Lewy body has a few characteristic findings. Um, people with Lewy body look Parkinsonian. They might be stiff. They might have more falls. They might have mask facies. They might have rigidity, all of these kinds of things. They don't necessarily have tremor. Only about 20% of people with Lewy body disease have tremor, but they will often have a lot of other Parkinson findings. The second major characteristic is fluctuating level of consciousness. So these are people who have good days and bad days. Now people with Alzheimer's dementia can also have good days and bad days, but it's not fluctuation like Lewy body dementia. And one of my patient's daughters told me this, a story that is so perfect. She said, you know what, on a good day, mom can walk outside the front door, pick up the paper, come in, read it, and three hours later have a conversation about what happened in the news. On a bad day, she steps out the front door to pick up the paper, wanders down the road, and has to be brought home by the cops. Okay, so huge fluctuations. And some people with Lewy body have what appear to be absent seizures. I had a woman who had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's and when I met her, she was toppling out of her chair. And she also had a gait disturbance, which had been previously undiagnosed. Um, and so she was doing this chair toppling, and she'd been sent to the ER twice for a syncope workup. And nothing was ever found. You know, they just couldn't, they just couldn't make any positive findings for any sort of cardiovascular disease or something like that. So I said, huh, you've got a gait disturbance, and you've got what appear to be these little absent seizures. Do you ever see things that don't really <laughs> exist? And she said, oh yeah, I've got these two little men. They're, they've been there for years. They're kind of on the smallish side. I'm not really afraid of them. And I'm like, have you never told anyone about these two little men? And she said, oh, I think I might have mentioned it to my daughter. But so she had Lewy body dementia, right? That had been unrecognized previously, um, but she had all of the characteristics. So typically, people will have well-formed visual hallucinations. About 90% of the time, the hallucinations are visual. The other 10% of the time, it's auditory, um, but mostly visual. And it's often time of children or pets. I have one lady with Lewy body. Her hallucination is a, a dog sitting next to her. She says, don't you take my dog away. That dog's my friend, and I don't even have to walk him. <laughs> I was like, I kind of wish you were getting out there walking your dog. <laughs> but um, anyway, so a lot of people kind of like their hallucinations that they have with Lewy body, but sometimes they can be very distressing. These people have a lot of attention and executive function disturbances. Their memory might be pretty well preserved. I had a lady who was, she was amazing. She was actually really consistent over a number of years. On a bad day, her MMSE score was 16. On a good day, her MMSE score was 26. She fluctuated that much from a bad day to a good day. And on a good day, she was pretty good. She went to Nordstrom shopping with her daughter. Because not only could she met, remember things on a good day, but she could also walk on a good day. And on a bad day, she wasn't really walking. So that's what Lewy body is like. It's, a, it's more common than, than previously recognized, and it's really important. And a few caveats on our patients who have Lewy body. 
First of all, they are really sensitive to those neuroleptics. Because of the Parkinsonism, if you accidentally give them Haldol, they could have marked worsening of their Parkinsonism. And it might be permanent. It might not rever be reversible if you stop the Haldol. Also, if you think that person might have, be, have Parkinson's disease and you give them some cinnamon, they can have terrible worsening of both cognition and their visual hallucinations. So the drugs for Parkinson's can be extremely dangerous in this population. Not permanent, the antipsychotic. It might be permanent as well. Yeah, it, they, may, they may not go back to their prior baseline when you stop that Parkinson's drug. So it's really important to think about the possibility of Lewy body dementia before you treat Parkinsonism in an older patient. Um, the good news is that this group of patients is exquisitely sensitive to the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors such as denepazil. And if you've not found those drugs to be successful in other patients, because you know they're really not all that great, please, if you think somebody might have Lewy body dementia, give, a, give the drugs a try because they might take away their visual hallucinations and they might markedly improve cognition for that group of patients. And there was a paper, paper study just last year that showed that people with Lewy body, when they were started on denepazil, in just 12 weeks, their MMSC score went up by four points. So compare that to what we just said about the typical course of Alzheimer's and how denepazil does not make for any improvement in MMSC scores. Rather, with this population, you might see some actual real improvement. Lewy body dementia often happens in people in their 60s and 70s, and the time from onset to death is only five to seven years, compared to Alzheimer's where it's 10 to 14, so a pretty significant drop in life expectancy in people with Lewy body. Any questions? Yeah. Um, sometimes I have patients, not very often, but sometimes I have patients who get hallucinations on their cinema that they're being treated for Yes, Parkinson's. yes. Is that, is that Yes, that, that may be your that, 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 that there are enough of a population who gets hallucinations with yeah, the Yeah. That may be your clue that that person has Lewy body disease instead of Parkinsonism, instead of Parkinson's disease. Now, then people ask me, okay, well, how do you tell the difference between Parkinson's and Lewy body then? Um, and people with Parkinson's disease, on average, don't have trouble with cognitive impairment for at least seven years. So Parkinson's can definitely lead to dementia, but it's usually at least seven years later. In Lewy body dementia, the Parkinson's symptoms and the cognitive impairment happen concomitantly, or in a, at least within a year or two of each other. So you're gonna have much earlier cognition problems in those patients. And oftentimes, if somebody gets hallucinations on Cinemat, it's because it really was Lewy body, okay? So yeah, that, that's your first clue, stop that Cinemat, do a good cognitive testing on them, and maybe watch them over time for a few months and kind of see what happens. Um, but yeah, that, I, I use that as a clue that it might be Lewy body instead of Parkinson's. Now granted, people with Parkinson's can occasionally get hallucinations, so it's not 100%. Um, but if you've got somebody who gets hallucinations with Cinemet, stop the drug, and then reassess cognition, reassess for the possibility that this is really Lewy body dementia. Frenotemporal, this is a tough one. Um, decline in the personal or social interpersonal conduct, um, impaired reasoning, difficulty with tasks. Has people seen this dementia, frenotemporal? This is a tough one, isn't it? There are no good drugs. There's not a single drug that has been found to be useful. This is where you really do want to get your team involved and you know, have them see the social worker if possible. You know, have them see the therapist and just, they, they're probably going to need to um, go to a memory care facility fairly quickly average time between diagnosis and being admitted to a memory facility is only 18 months for frontotemporal, and average time from diagnosis to death is only three to six years in frontotemporal. So it's much shorter. Okay, so here's the overall differential diagnosis. And as you can see, Alzheimer's is the most common, 40% in the pure form, and then mixed Alzheimer's, Lewy body, and mixed Alzheimer's and vascular, very common as well. But as much of 20, as 25% of patients are either pure Lewy body or mixed Lewy body in Alzheimer's. So it is probably a type of dementia that we're under-recognizing to some extent. 
All right, um, I know a few people weren't here right at the start. We started talking about a patient, Mrs. Atkinson. Um, further exam of her showed that she was disheveled, hard of hearing. She had a non-focal neuro exam. She'd had slow onset of memory decline over two to three years. And in her, you decided to do a slums test, and she got a total of 18 out of 30 points. Um, somebody who was here for the whole time want to say which type of dementia she's got? Colleen, give, give a try. I'm You're still worried about that diphenhydramine. No, no, I really <laughs> It's possible, but I didn't. I hadn't mentioned a history of a stroke, and it's really hard to give, have vascular dementia if you don't have a history of a stroke. So she probably has Alzheimer's. She'd had gradual progress progression, memory impairment being at the forefront, and then a little bit of ADL problems, and um, less than 20 on her slums exam. So one of the more standard presentations that we're going to see with dementia. So we already talked a little bit about the cholinesterase inhibitors. This was a uh, review that was done in 2008 of the drugs themselves and they looked at people with moderate to uh, mild to moderate disease and there was a statistically significant difference and here's kind of a summary of what we already talked a little bit about S delay in disease progression of about seven months for people who had mild disease or two to five months in, a peop in somebody with moderate disease so it doesn't give you much time but I can say that if I'm the person with dementia, I probably still want you to let me try it, right? Because even if I'm going to get an extra seven months of quality of life, that, that might be worth it to me. But again, you know, at a population level, the cost effectiveness of these drugs is pretty marginal. Um, memantine used mostly in moderate to severe disease. Uh, monotherapy can be used at that stage of disease or it can be used in combination with a cholinesterase inhibitor. Um, the important thing to remember about this drug, um, this is uh, Nemenda, is that if people have reduced renal function, you have to use a smaller dosage. Don't put, get them all the way up to the 10 milligrams BID. Thanks for coming. Um, all right, supplements, what do you think? <sighs> Nothing, right? Sorry. Um, exercise and diet? Can I get a little more excitement? <laughs> probably, some, probably some positive results. You know, our evidence review showed that they were, there were um, small but statistically significant benefits from exercise in randomized trials. Everybody should be doing it anyway for your heart, right, Bob? So um, <laughs> might as well do that. And then um, the Mediterranean diet so far has only been followed in cohort studies but in cohort studies has been shown to be effective. I am hoping that, did you see the um, New England Journal article on uh, the randomized trial of Mediterranean diet for heart disease? That they gave people olive oil or nuts just free, they sent it to them, and then um, and their cardiovascular outcomes were markedly improved, right? It's like a magic pill, uh, more olive oil in everybody's diet. Um, I'm really hoping the Spanish government doesn't go bankrupt because I'm sure they've measured cognitive um, outcomes in that study, and they need to report those outcomes before <laughs> before they totally go bankrupt. Um, because I'm, I think that the randomized trials are going to bear out that Mediterranean diet does reduce um, dementia. All right, how many people refer to the Alzheimer's Association? Yeah, so we sometimes forget they are a wonderful partner and colleague. They are. They have so many resources. They are lovely, they have a 24-7 helpline so that a caregiver can call any time, day and night if you know, somebody's trying to beat them up or they won't go to bed or they're you know, peeing in the hallway. You can call the Alzheimer's Association 24-7 and get help <coughs> with those problems, okay? It's a wonderful thing. I had a patient who was pooping in the closet five times a night and the caregiver came in and she said, you know what, I called the Alzheimer's Association and we figured it out and he doesn't poop in the closet anymore. I, won't go, I don't have time to go into explaining how, how they got the guy out of the, out of the closet. <laughs> it was basically making the closet look less like a 
comfort place and having the bathroom look more like a comfort place. <laughs> so um, I guess it's kind of like your dog, right? You got to make the... Um, so uh, give all patients and family uh, members the phone number for the Alzheimer's helpline. And then um, there is a nice... Uh, trial match site that if a patient is interested in being in a research study or if there's a family member who th says you know what is there any experimental thing my dad could get to try to do a better job with his dementia you can refer them to that site um, and that can be helpful I think everybody knows this because we are in Oregon thank goodness but I, I just put it up here as a as a reminder don't let your patients get feeding tubes I, th I think we're probably all pretty good about that already um, you know allow natural death and and we have these conversations with our patients. Do you guys put your dementia patients on hospice? Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. It's a little bit hard, isn't it? Because how do you know when they're eligible? And I mean, sometimes it's obvious because they're bed bound and they're not doing anything. But um, we do under refer our dementia patients to hospice. And I think it is because we just have trouble kind of knowing when it is. But, um, you know, Here's the eligibility. They can't do any of their own ADLs. They can speak no more than six words at a time, and then they have to have another dementia-related comorbidity, such as weight loss, aspiration pneumonia, decubitus ulcers, things like that. So the criteria are pretty strict if the diagnosis is dementia. But um, I, think it's, uh, I think it's worthy of, of trying to figure out when we can get our patients into hospice. Because we also forget to turn off their we also forget to turn off their defibrillators, don't we? Yeah, so, and that's part of that picking them up early enough to talk about this in advance, right? Because there needs to be a stage when we say, okay, time to turn off the defibrillator. <coughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, I can't tell you how many times, you know, patient has been put into hospice and then the hospice provider says, what's that? <laughs> and finds the defibrillator. And we're like, uh-oh, forgot to have that conversation. Yeah, well, and Elizabeth was just pointing out here an uh, even tougher question is, can you, should you, could you turn off the pacemaker? Uh, yeah, that's, that's even throwing your mind. Um, yeah, so I've come down on the side of not turning off the pacemaker. You know, pacemakers are comfort. Yeah. And you can decline really quickly. I mean, some people aren't using their pacer that much, and maybe they would do just fine having it turned off. But I, I turn off the defibrillator, but not the pacemaker. And sometimes that's a difficult discussion to have with a family because they they don't quite know the difference and they don't really understand it very well. Um, but yeah, I, I I don't turn off pacemakers. I do turn My off defibrillators. Is similar, isn't yeah. It? it often creates more problems than it solves. Yeah. But unless you're sure that the patient is going to die. Right. Right then and there. Off. Right. And it brings a, a resolution to yeah. the issue. But uh, to have them start fainting now right. and coming to the ER and is admitted and stuff really is, unfortunate. Is, is really a disservice. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Thank you. Um, I'm sure you've already read this, so I'm not going to go through it again. Um, okay, so hopefully, in the last little bit of time, I've um, convinced you all that your skills at diagnosing dementia are excellent and that you can also sort out what type of dementia they have and hopefully kind of use the right drugs and strategies as, you know, as possible for um, the specific types of dementia and particularly, you know, some of the caveats with Lewy body are, are, are going to be really important to remember. Um, any, any questions about that so far or comments you want to make? Yeah. With the slums or the, the right. uh, those delved in the non-English speaking population? Oh, great question. So slums, not so much. But mocha, you can get online in about 20 different languages. It's amazing. It's, it's Korean. I mean, yeah, it's in that language. And I don't, I can't remember if the pictures are the same or if they're like a Korean animal instead of an American. <laughs> but I think rhinoc rhinoceros is on there, which really isn't an American animal either. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, mochatest.org. The first thing you'll have to do is plug in which language you want it in. And I've had um, interpreters on the phone, actually, and a Korean language mocha. And the interpreter 
I, and I emailed the interpreter, you know, the MOCA test, so they had it in front of them as well. And they basically used their interpreter skills over the phone to help that person do the MOCA test in their language and then kind of tell, told me what the score was because I, I wasn't going to be able to figure out any other way. But it is certainly possible to use that in a number of other languages. Yeah, that's a great question. Okay. Um, okay, let's move on, um, and I can see that we're not going to have a ton of time to do some of, some of these other things, but let's talk a little bit about driving. So here's another patient, uh, Mr. Hart, he's actually Dr. Hart, he's a professor at, from uh, Harvard, um, proud that he's already learned to drive, and I just detect a few red flags in his story, so I decided to do a slums test on him, and uh-oh, it's 22. I mean, this guy's a PhD. That's probably not where he started, is it? So this guy's got mild cognitive impairment, and the first thing he says to me is, I will never give up driving. <laughs> Anyone ever have a patient like this? No, I know you haven't. <laughs> what would you do? What do you do? Do you need to take his license away now? Well, if you're hardcore, you might, I suppose, huh? Uh, so technically, no. The, in, in Oregon, the, the answer to that question is no. He, he, you have to have evidence of severe impairment. You know, like severe and, you know, now, eminent? Is that the right word? You know, danger now. And in somebody who's got a 22 on their slums test and seems to be doing okay, even though his wife thinks he's had a few near misses, we do not have clear and convincing evidence of severe impairment. So technically, we don't yet have to report this guy to the DMV. That makes me a little bit nervous sometimes. It probably makes you a little bit nervous sometimes. But, but, um, but if we did report him and then he passed the test, he'd probably be really mad at us. Um, and so, so what do you do? Well, obviously, driving is so important. 88% of older Americans rely on an automobile. I mean, that's huge, isn't it? And driving cessation leads to all sorts of trouble that our patients are well aware of. Um, and there's a huge list of medical reasons why somebody could have impaired driving. Um, all of these things can lead to problems behind the wheel. Um, this is a nice um, protocol that we put together at OHSU that kind of starts with some of these triggers in the story, um, and then these are the exams that they would lead to. So the most important things you'll be doing with your patient is some vision screening, um, and you know most of this can be done right in the office. You don't have to send them to the ophthalmologist for this. Um, clock draw on trails, we already talked about them, right? Those are gonna be the main cognitive test if you're worried about your patient's driving um, that to, uh, to do for them. And then, of course, the physical side. They have to have reasonable strength, reasonable flexibility. Um, you'd like to see a get up and go test less than 15 seconds, just kind of as a marker of their mobility. Um, and then uh, tendon, deep tendon reflexes and sensation intact. And then, of course, no deficits. Review their dry, safe driving every year, kind of reassess. Um, and then if you do identify deficits, maybe some of them are correctable. I mean, you know, some people can go to PT and improve their uh, muscular status. Um, maybe they could go to occupational therapy, do some driving retraining, but, um, but that's the pathway you're going to go down. Um, if they have just mild deficits, but you want to do a referral, you, you don't have to fill out the mandatory impairment form. You could just do a voluntary, um, voluntary uh, DMV referral. Um, to ask for a, a, a better driver evaluation from the DMV, and you could do that without doing the mandatory form. But of course, if there's a severe deficit, then you would want to fill out the mandatory impairment form. Um, any questions about this? That's kind of a quickie, but you've, we've got it in your slides. What yeah. If, what if they refuse to do the uh, DMV driver safety eval? Yeah. And you're kind of on the fence. You're kind of, a, yeah. Well, so that's a great question. Um, and so, I do try to make friends with my patients and you know, kind of have them not refuse things too much and, and cajole them into doing things. And you know, your daughter's worried about you. Can't you just do it for her? And you know, kind of talk about that. Um, if somebody truly refuses when I think they really should have it, I don't push it for today. I say, okay, 
I'm not going to, you know, we're, we're going to let this lie for today, but I, I think we're going to need to readdress it w within the next couple of months. And then, of course, they don't come back and see me again for three years, right? But, uh, <laughs> but I, I tell them, you know, I think we need to readdress this at our next visit and um, because I am, I am truly concerned. And I'll ask for things like, you know, have a family member drive with them and, you know, see how, if they feel safe to them and talk to the family members and say, you know, I think your dad does have some red flags for driving. Um, can you guys kind of talk together and maybe come up with a plan that would be, that would be acceptable? Um, within the next couple of months. So I, I try to allow them some autonomy and some kind of control of the situation, but at the same time, I don't just drop it. You know, I say, we're gonna rediscuss this soon. Um, unless I really think they're, I mean, if I truly think they're impaired, you know, if their slums is 15 and they can't do a clock, then I say, well, then I apologize, but I'm gonna have to fill out the form. And the, you know, one of the things is that a lot of these family members have been trying to get dad to stop driving for years already, right? And sometimes if we take the responsibility to report, that does make the daughter or son not the bad guy. You know, it's better for us to be the bad guy than for a family member to have to be the bad guy. And I would rather kind of do that dirty work and, and put in the form than have that family feel like they have to keep kind of pressing. Elizabeth? So just going back to your slide uh -huh. before, with just for you, for any of these deficits, are you, any one of those, you're saying they should stop driving? Or yes. Level of, so yes. If, if you can't get their vision up to 2040, if you can't. Correct. Right. Yep. If you can't, if you can't, you know, if you can't get your cognition better with some cognitive retraining sorts of things, and if you can't get your extremity strength, you only have to have one of those to not be able to drive any longer. Vision, cognition, neuromuscular. Yeah. Yeah. It's You're not. Very flexible with your clock. You want a good clock. I want a good clock. Yeah. 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 I need to have a good clock. And I mean, we 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 tend to we tend to be a little. Um, Loosey goosey sometimes in our clocks, but but if if you're looking at a clock and you're not sure whether you should score it, you know, full points or not, draw a clock yourself, and compare your patient's clock to your own clock, and if their clock is not as good as yours, then their clock there's probably something wrong with their clock. Okay, they should be able to draw a normal clock. Now, if you if you can't <laughs> if you can't draw a normal clock now, put that in your medical records because you want to be able to show somebody down the line that you've never been able to do a normal <laughs> clock, right? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so I know you guys have gotten epic recently and we've developed a bunch of kind of dot phrases and things um, around driving. If anybody's interested in just using some of this stuff, let me know and I'll be, I'll be happy to share some of, our, some of the stuff we've uh, done. We've got some um, patient instructions, all kinds of things like that. All right, so Mr. Hart, not unsafe to drive yet, but you suggest he start thinking about alternatives to driving. So this guy happens to live in Portland and he was on a streetcar line, which I was really happy about. And um, so I suggest, he, he was like, no, I will never take the bus. I will never take the streetcar. It's just not gonna happen. Well, luckily, um, the next time he came back and he's like, hey, you're gonna be so proud of me. I took the streetcar, you know? So even though he was adamant against it, when we talked the first time, he did kind of um, agree over time to start doing it. Um, and he's now using the bus in high traffic. Actually, I just saw him last week and I had to take his license away completely, but by then he know now he knows the bus system so well that he didn't even mind. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip this case. Um, this is going into the drugs because we're about out of time and I want a little time for chat yet. Um, but let's talk about Fred for just a moment. All right. Fred is 87 and he's admitted to your hospital with GI illness and dehydration. These are his medical problems. These are his medications. He's got an estimated creatinine clearance of 28. And I recommend anyone who's over 80 to calculate creatinine clearance using Cockroft Galt. Most of our systems use MDRD, including mine. It overestimates creatinine clearance 50% of the time in people over 80. So, you know, go to nephron.com and use the Cockroft Galt calculator to calculate the estimated GFR for your patients. 
Um, all right, uh, which, which of these medications are a problem for this guy with his current situation? Ferrosamide, yeah, <laughs> right. Well, um, yeah. Aricept, good, good. Why, why is the denepazil a problem, do you think? Why is the Aricept a problem? Because you need to have good cardiac. You need to have good Plus, he's got CAD, and he might have bradycardia from it, and he might, might be a major problem. What else? Well, I mean, he's having problems, which is a problem, so that could be related to Yep, absolutely. He, this could all be a side effect of his denepazil, couldn't it? The DI illness and dehydration. What else? What else meds yeah, which other meds are a problem? Zolpidem. Zolpidem, good. Excellent. And also, what, what GFR can you go down to with alendronate? Do you know? Take half of it if you Well, that's what some people say. So below a GFR of 34, alendronate is probably not doing much good. I have some bone colleagues who say, well, even if it's doing a tiny bit of good, you should keep using it. And I'm kind of like, with its side effect profile, I want it to be doing more than a tiny bit of good. So I typically stop alendronate below 34. Good. What's the GFR cutoff on that one? Thanks. It's probably about 44, actually. So that one's pretty high. You're right. Um, OK. Well, here you are. Most of what he's on is either a red flag or a yellow flag for somebody his age. You know, hypotension and cognitive impairment. All of these are probably risky in somebody with type 2 diabetes. And um, there's now a re recommendation against, I think it's from the um, American Board of Family Medicine, recommendation against doing finger sticks in people who are just on oral. Um, diabetic drugs, which I love that recommendation. So, um, so just kind of thinking about our patients and how many things they end up on. You know, they're just collecting baggage all their lives. And Fred probably needs most of these stopped. All right, who, who knows about the beers criteria, the beers list? This was just updated in 2012, so it's pretty recent, pretty good. And um, you can get a free app from the American Geriatrics website. Um, so it, it can be really handy and easy to kind of pull up and use on your patients. Um, and then have you seen the Choosing Wisely campaign? I think that finger stick one is the American Board of Family Medicine's Choosing Wisely. But for dementia or for geriatric patients, the Choosing Wisely um, items are no feeding tubes in dementia, try not to use antipsychotics if at all possible, don't lower hemoglobin A1C below 7.5, for your older patients, people over 75. No benzos if possible. And then don't use antimicrobials to treat bacteria unless there are specific urinary tract symptoms. All right, questions? So that was kind of a quickie through dementia and then a little bit on driving and drugs. There's certainly plenty more we could talk about, but um, you guys have thoughts? Can you comment on this program? Yes, it's fabulous. Um, and it's available. Stay, uh, Megan, is that, isn't that driving program available um, to everyone? We, you talked with a person at our recent conference about that a little bit. Yeah, I don't, I, I think it's just a referral. Is and it expensive or no, I, 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 yeah, I don't. I think it's covered, or I don't. I don't think the patient pays anything for it. So yeah. All right. Is that OHSU? It's not OHSU. Nope. Oh. Um, we learned about them through a um, conference where they were at, but it's a it's a state funded program. Doesn't OHSU have a, a driving simulator or something? We have an occupational therapy driving evaluation program, and there are a number of them around the state as well um, to, to do a, a driving evaluation. They cost a little bit over $200 Maybe or that's so. one that I thought was expensive. Yeah. This one you think is covered by insurance. I think that one's covered, yeah. Mm -hmm. you, that's, that's what we learned because we, we talked to the people who were sponsoring it. And when I tried to use this as a uh, 
something we used in Idaho. We had really good rehab medicine. We yeah. said someone said, well, see if you pass your test. Yeah, yeah. And if they didn't pass their test, you say, now we have to right. have your license. Right. And I got this vague one from the one I tried to refer to here. So is, do you get more concrete feedback from this one? Yeah. Um, I believe so. Although the, so there is a strict, I don't think this is a strict driving evaluation program. Okay. And the, the driving evaluation programs are paid for by some insurances if you use a diagnosis of cognitive impairment or you know neck pain or something like that. Um, many people's insurance does pay for one driving evaluation in their life. Um, not everybody has even that paid for. And that's, that is, that's the strict evaluation. That's not driver rehab. That's just evaluation. I think these guys are more on the rehab side of things and you know, helping to make improvements in your driving, not doing a strict driver evaluation. But I'm not absolutely positive. And OHSU we, has a strict driving evaluation. OHSU does not have, we, well, we have, OTs will do a driving eval, which might be covered if you send somebody to OT for cognitive impairment. Um, it's not the same as, like Providence has a real driving evaluation program in Portland, and that's kind of the highest level driving evaluation program. Our OTs are not doing quite this. Like, they're not pe taking people and doing on-the-road testing with them, Good. and I'm pretty sure the Providence one is. Um, so I would go through Providence. You guys are Providence anyway, so you can probably um, <laughs> get, that re you know, get that referral. Um, yeah, good question. All right, if, if you guys would take a, f a minute and fill out this green form, since we're from the Geriatric Education Center, we would love to just quickly collect um, your demographic data to turn back into HRSA and, um, and so that we can uh, you know, make sure they know who we've chatted with today. Any other questions? All right, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>